That's live. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our sixth live office hour for the MOOC on Environmental Security and Sustaining Peace. I'm Carl Brook. I direct international programs at the Environmental Law Institute. I'm here with Erica Weinthal. Erica is one of the core faculty for this course. She's the Lee Hill Snowden Professor of Environmental Policy at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. She specializes in global environmental politics and environmental security, with a particular emphasis on water and energy. Her current areas of research include global environmental politics and governance, environmental conflict and peace building, the political economy of the resource curse, and climate change adaptation. Erica's research spans multiple geographic regions, including the Soviet successor states, the Middle East, South Asia, East Africa, and North America. Today, we will be answering a mix of questions, some that were submitted ahead of today's session, and some that we are receiving from you live as we go through the office hour. We'll do our best to get through all of them. If we don't, we encourage you to post your questions in the office hours and other discussion groups. And uh, before we dive in, Erica, maybe you could say a little bit more about yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Carl, for that very kind introduction. Um, as Carl noted, I am a professor of environmental policy at Duke University and the Nicholas School of the Environment. I am trained as a political scientist who has often engaged with the practi practitioner community on issues surrounding environmental security and peace building. And as a result, a lot of my research has focused on water cooperation and conflict, the resource curse, um, looking at the role of the extractive industries in the former Soviet Union. Um, I also work on issues related to climate change um, and climate change adaptation in East Africa. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Um, Erica, I'm wondering if maybe we could start by talking about some of your research and uh, work in conflict affected settings and wonder if there are any um, uh, places that you've worked on uh, energy in conflict affected settings. Thanks, Carl. Um, so my um, early work focused on the former Soviet Union and the, and, um, the um, Central Asian states, the Caucasus, Russia, um, looking at um, the role of energy in um, the political and economic development of primarily the states that bordered the Caspian region. Some of those states have um, experienced conflicts such as um, Azerbaijan with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Others, um, there was always a sense that these were new states that were weakly institutionalized. Um, Uzbekistan many, many years ago um, during the last years of the Soviet Union had experienced conflict in the Fergana Valley over natural resources, largely water and land. So there was a deep interest in understanding how the extractives could be used for promoting economic development, but also um, helping with the, tra the political transition um, as they were new states entering the international um, community of nation states. So in this um, research, we were very interested in understanding um, the different mechanisms that were created to manage the revenue um, that was being generated largely by contracts with international oil companies or also by state-owned oil companies. And one of the tools that we were looking at at that point concerned natural resource funds as a mechanism for helping to smooth out um, the revenue that was generated from the oil and gas sector. Uh, I'd like to come back to the uh, to the benefit sharing of the natural resource funds. Uh, you you talked about the water the, your work on water your work on energy and um, outside the. Uh, peace building context, there's a lot of thinking going on right now on the water, energy, food nexus. And I'm wondering if um, you might be able to briefly explain that and then to talk a little bit about how that is different in a conflict affected setting. Sure. Um, if so at all. 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, this is this is a really important topic. And a lot of my thinking really did come out of my early work in the Soviet Union and Central Asia, um, largely because at the time there was a lot of interest among the international community on how to prevent conflict among the Central Asian states. I was looking at the RLC and the desiccation of the RLC um, after, you know, decades of using water for um, the growing of cotton in Central Asia. And one of the, um, what was really interesting at that time, the donors were so focused on just the water sector. And they went in um, with the notion that they were gonna design a water management scheme. And, you know, by being in the field and talking to the donors, the water managers, it became apparent that energy was just as important because in many water systems, not just in Central Asia, but also in the Nile Basin in particular, um, different states have different actress uh, or different interests. And this depends where they are when um, located along a river basin. So some um, states are located upstream, some are located downstream. We call these riparians upstream and downstream riparians. And often it is the downstream riparians that are the first to um, utilize water because they're in a delta like Egypt and the Nile Basin and these states um, use the water for agriculture so the agricultural sector often develops first and then later it's the upstream states that want to leverage and harness water for electricity production and that was what was happening in Central Asia and Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan it's happening today in Ethiopia in the Nile Basin wanting to build dams for hydroelectricity and so there are these trade-offs of how you manage an international water system. Um, and you know whether you use water for hydroelectricity or for agriculture. Um, but at the same time, it's you know, you can look at it through the lens of water energy, but it's also about food production. And so you need to bundle these together to really have a holistic approach if you're using a river, you know, looking at the whole catchment area, the whole basin, um, but also, you know balancing the interests and needs of the different states that shift over time and recognizing that patterns that are locked in early may not be um, as um, relevant decades later as population size changes, migration, um, just the diversification of the economy. And so this is really relevant in today's context for a lot of um, states emerging from conflict because you can't just take a narrow sectoral approach. And what we've argued in the water volume, um, that the volume that looks at water and post-conflict peace building that's available at the um, Environmental Peace Building website, is this need for an intersectoral approach in the aftermath of conflict to look at water um, in relationship to energy. And this is really valid for Sudan and South Sudan, um, but also looking at the livelihoods and you know issues of land within that context. So having this much more holistic approach um, in the aftermath of conflict. And it seems like part of the part of the reason for that is technical and part is political. So on the technical side, it's um, it's not just a question of how much water goes to what purpose, because it, like in the uh, Rogan Dam uh, example that you were alluding to, right. um, that it's also a question of timing that uh, water is needed at certain times for energy and at different times in different volumes for cotton production. And so uh, that there, there, it may be that if you're managing water for one purpose or for another, that, you're, um, that, that that will influence how you allocate water, how you, how, when you let the water flow through. Right. Yeah, and then that's really what um, a lot of the donors have begun to look at was how do you optimize the different uses um, in a dam because you can essentially generate hydro and make sure that water um, can be utilized for the agricultural sector. But that really requires the work of um, lawyers like yourself, Carl, um, who have this expertise um, in international water law that can help to draft international water agreements that can take into account um, the different needs of the population. And I don't know if you want to comment more on, you know, progress that has been made in international water law or the work that's going on um, in this area. 
Um, it, it's really interesting because uh, most of the um, most of the examples I know of, they they relate either to water quantity or water quality. So right. the amount of pollution that, uh, whether it's, say in the Rhine River, uh, right. that they're realizing that a lot of the countries in the 60s and 70s were uh, polluting the river. And so there was a process that was developed legally to uh, address pollution in the Rhine River. Um, and water qu quantity, it, this, it's which country gets how much um, and maybe when, but it's not necessarily on an hour by hour basis. Uh, right. and, and so it, the question of emulating the spring floods or whatever, th this can be, uh, it's, it's a very different process where you might want to have um, uh, hydropower at a certain time or if you have the dam being used for hydropower and then you get more rain the questions of uh, release and notification of downstream uh, communities th there's some of that but the, the I haven't seen much talk uh, much legal development of the on the energy side of how to manage water flows for that um, it may it may be there. I, I'm just yeah. not familiar with it. Well, what, one of the things you are raising um, that is incredibly important and often included in a lot of water agreements is um, the importance of communication among the different water managers, and that's often been institutionalized through the creation of a joint water uh, management committee. And so, I think a lot of these issues can be tackled if you have a functioning um, joint water committee or river basin organization that meets regularly, that shares information, that can constantly update their river management plans, depending also on um, you know, how much rainfall you have in a particular year, um, that isn't just focused on fixed allocation amounts, because that's often where you see um, conflicts arising if there are, you know, requirements for a fixed allocation rather than looking at a percentage depending on variation in, you know, rainfall and other variables. The, the other thing that I think you, you raised that was so um, important is that this isn't just a question of coordination within a country between the different ministries mm -hmm. or even between the upstream and downstream riparians. It's also really important to get the donors coordinated yes. because they they often drive uh, the development agenda after conflict, especially when countries' capacity is maybe uh, um, diminished. Right, and we did have a whole chapter on the importance of coordination um, as part of this MOOC, um, largely because increasingly in um, post-conflict countries you have so many actors that are involved at the different stages even of the conflict cycle. So you have you know, humanitarian actors who come in immediately after the conflict. You have those that are focused more on development. You have those that are focused more on the sector. But, you, but that's, those are the international actors. You have increasingly members of civil society um, and government actors who also have their own particular interests depending where they sit if they're in the land ministry versus the water ministry um, or, you know, the extractives. And so how do you, and also you have increasingly, you know, private sector actors. So how do you create mechanisms for coordination so that you don't have the replication of programs? One of the students asked you, and I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you, recognizing you're not a lawyer, but um, <laughs> is, there, is there any kind of international right for capturing water? Um, yes, recognizing that I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to ask the, you know, the, the lawyer to um, help out at any point. Um, you know, we don't look at first and right, first and might anymore, that notion that the first one gets to use the water. I mean, the idea really is to come up with a negotiated um, agreement that takes into account all the different interests and trying to find mutual um, to create a, um, a mechanism for mutual benefits. We don't, you know, it is not helpful to 
have one state say, well, I was here first and I'm going to take the water because this is, you know, I'm upstream. It's recognizing often that there's trade-offs, that this is a, there's issue linkages, that if you take all the water, um, a downstream state may not want to sell you electricity or, or, you know, other oil and gas, I should say, or other resources, or there may be issues related to migration. Um, if you have pastoralists who are crossing borders. So you really want um, not to focus on this right to capture the water, but really how do you share water um, that is mutually beneficial for everyone? And I think, you know, international law or international lawyers would um, push to have that type of international agreement um, rather than, you know, um, having, you know, this built in right just to capture water without talking to your neighbors. And, and, and there are, there are um, both principles in treaties and in uh, international law, case law. Um, and uh, international customary law that that address this, uh, generally referred to as the reasonable and equitable utilization, right. doesn't define what's reasonable, doesn't define what's equitable, but it provides at least a starting point for the uh, for the negotiations that you mentioned. And the uh, the other thing that I think you you highlighted there that is um, a principle of uh, customary international law is the requirement to consult your neighbors when you're doing when you're developing transboundary water courses so I, I think that that's uh, um, there there's some law but so much of it is actually borne out through the uh, water body specific uh, agreements that are negotiated and concluded um like to uh, um, turn to another question that uh, um, somebody asked. Some of your latest research deals with the wartime targeting of civilian environmental infrastructure, including water infrastructure. Why do you think this trend is emerging now? And how does it change the work of people working in uh, post-conflict settings uh, or even in the negotiation of peace agreements? Um, thanks. Um whoever wanted to talk about my most recent research. Um, I'm always delighted to um, have a conversation about the targeting of what we call environmental infrastructure. I know humanitarian organizations um, focus much more on civilian infrastructure. So I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, there are different um, ways of talking about the same issue. Um, you know, this isn't something new. So I just want to preface it with um, acknowledging that Environmental resources, particularly water, have often been targeted in war. There's a rich literature also looking at, um, you know, the targeting of water as a tool of war, um, going back to ancient times. But it, the reason we're focusing on it is increasingly we're seeing it happen more and more. Um, and I should also note, you know, states have often used what we call the scorched earth policy. Um, we saw this in the Iraq war um, with the blowing up, you know, with um, the, destru the destruction of the um, oil, um, the Kuwaiti oil fields and, um, you know, or destroying irrigation systems in Afghanistan um, as the Soviet army pulled out. So this isn't, you know, new, but it's, happening, um, you know, we're able to document it more and more. And it's not these big incidents. It's where you have, um, you know, an electrical plant that is bombed that takes out the water system. Um, and part of the reason we're seeing it um, in, you know, we're seeing it increasingly in the wars in the Middle East um, is where my research is focusing is largely because a lot of these wars are urban wars. They're not taking place um, in, you know, the rural, the rural areas. Um, so, you, and this goes back to where, um, Carl, we started the conversation today about the intersection between water and energy. Um, in, the, in urban centers, water and energy are coupled. And so if you take out electricity, you're taking out a 
a city's sanitation system. And so you'll have waste, you know, flowing in the streets. And part of the reason we're interested in this is a lot of social scientists who study war often focus on civilian deaths. And, you know, when you have direct targeting and you can, you know, you have civilian body counts. We are um, concerned about the targeting of water systems, electricity energy systems, um, waste systems, but also hospitals, because it, this um, doesn't result in immediate deaths, but it has very long-term consequences um, for human health and for ecosystems, because one of the things we will see in many conflict zones um, is the prevalence of cholera as what has happened in um, Yemen with the large cholera outbreak. We've also seen a cholera outbreak in Iraq, but also when you target um, water systems, um, you also, or medical facilities, it makes it much harder for humanitarian actors just to do, um, you know, to um, carry out polio eradication um, programs. And so you're seeing an increase in the prevalence of what would be waterborne Ill illnesses or um, also impacts on ecosystems as waste is, you know, flowing into water systems or, um, you know, into the streets. Um. So this is this is something that keeps you up uh, at night, I can tell. I'm wondering, are there any other environmental trends at, at, the, at the intersection of water and security that, um, that keep you up? Things that, uh, that are emerging or th that um, uh, recent trends? Um, so, I mean, that keep me up at night. Um, I mean, part, part of it is, is really this new area of research, um, just because, you know, we have a body of international law that has been designed, um, you know, to um, ensure that, again, what is often called civilian infrastructure or water infrastructure is not targeted in war. Like, you are not supposed to target wells or, you um, dams, you know, if it is essential for human um, well-being. And, you know, this is additional protocol one and two of the Geneva Conventions. Um, but, you know, it's, we, um, you know, international law hasn't been able to prevent it. And so it's, you know, trying to figure out what can be done to ensure that people have access to basic water and sanitation. So that's really the issue that drives all of my research is just, you know, how do we ensure that people have access to clean water at a minimum and basic sanitation? So a lot of my research also focuses on the sustainable development goal that deals with water and sanitation um, and thinking about it in post-conflict settings because one of the things that we've, um, documented also in the volume on water and post-conflict peace building is it's much easier to attract foreign investment in these high value um, resource sectors. So, um, you know, companies, the private sector will come in if they know they can invest in mining, if they can invest um, in oil and gas, even timber. But when it comes to water, it's not a really lucrative sector. And at the end of the day, it is, you know, the most important resource that is necessary for, um, you know, emerging from conflict is ensuring that people have sustainable livelihoods and that they have their basic human needs provided for. So that's really where my research um, concentrates is on how do you, you know, um, generate interest in um, engaging with the water and sanitation sector um, and doing so in a way that, um, you know, provides for a basic minimum, um, you know, for the population. Um, and one would think this is the easiest thing 
um, possible, but it's turned out to be one of the most challenging sectors to work in. I think, you know, um, working in the extractives, there's a lot more um, emphasis on what mechanisms can be put in place to protect, you know, communities from, um, you know, different investments. Um, but the water sector, um, you know, we don't have a, um, a consortium of, you know, the private sector, the NGOs in the same way that are really coming in at, at war's end to provide clean water and sanitation. Um, you mentioned the, the financial side, and I'm wondering, have you found any promising avenues for stimulating uh, investment uh, or um, reorienting or focusing uh, over official development assistance to advance this? Um, so... You know, one of the things that's, you know, when it comes to the water sector, it's often left um, to humanitarian actors um, to provide clean water. And the challenge has been at war's end. Um, how do you build up the government, you know, the government side? Um, because, you know, it's, you need a functioning water ministry, um, but it's not going to be similar to what we may have, you know, in the United States with large scale municipal systems. So there's, you know, there's a lot of research taking place on more decentralized forms of water provision. I think one of the interesting things that we realized um, in doing the case studies again for the water volume was the importance of the informal sector. Um, you know, we focus so much on wanting to create centralized bureaucracies for the provision of um, water and sanitation. And um, the case studies actually showed that there are a lot of um, different ways to provide water and sanitation. And so we shouldn't have a one fit, you know, all type strategy, but rather, um, you know, we sh and we also should um, not um, disregard what has transpired during conflict for providing water. So how do you engage those um, waters, um, you know, water providers that were selling water through water tankers in the informal market, is there a way to bring them into the formal sector? Um, because, you know, you don't want to, and it's also a way of providing employment. And so it's a way of thinking, you know, looking at the landscape, and this is why doing these assessments at war's end is so important, because it gives you an understanding of what already exists and what can be tapped and leveraged and, you know, and harnessed as part of building a more sustainable um, long-term sector. Um, you know, the other um, area that we saw really interesting results was just the importance of a community engagement and talking to women. Um, because it's often the women who are responsible for, um, you know, finding water, providing water for their communities and if you build a system that may be too far away where women still have to go, you know, um, walk long distances to go to a water pump or a water, you know, um, um, you know, a well, um, it may put women's um, safety at risk. And, you know, where there may have been conflict between different communities, we saw this um, in one of the case studies from the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, it was the women that were able to identify the appropriate solution and work with other women in other villages um, where the villages had not been cooperating before, but they were able to use mechanism or use water as the mechanism or the entry point um, for cooperation. And so just listening, you know, um, you know, to um, those that need water, such as the women, um, in some of um, these places may help identify appropriate solutions. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, this isn't like mining where you can come in and you know the tools, the technology that um, can be leveraged um, for mining or for oil and gas extraction, 
when it comes to water, there's a lot of different solutions. But in the post-conflict setting, it requires listening to the women or also looking at what was happening in the informal sector. Um, a student is asking about Lebanon. And um, uh, 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 I'll ask the question. I've, I've done some work there too, so I, I, I might be okay. able to help here. I want to ask if Dr. Erica has tackled the water issue in Lebanon, even though it was one of the Middle East's richest countries in water resources, the refugee situation has had its impact, given that Lebanon itself is a post-conflict state and Syria is in conflict and this water is currently being shared. Yet part of the water, yet I think they're saying, yet only, only part of the water users are actually paying taxes. Yeah. Um... I'm going to talk about it a little bit more broadly because I think the Syrian conflict um, and the refugee situation that has been generated doesn't just affect Lebanon, it affects Turkey, it affects Jordan, it affects a large number of states in the Middle East, um, and it generates lessons um, for um, you know countries that are welcoming to refugee populations. And this is something that's really um, important primarily to for um, you know the the um, the international community that works with refugees um, because often where you site a refugee camp is where there's water. I mean, it's one of the first priorities is ensuring that people again have access to water. Um, but you know, parts of the Middle East are very dry, um, particularly Jordan. Um, is a water poor country. Lebanon has more water, but it's also unevenly distributed um, in Lebanon and, you know, similarly with Turkey. And um, it requires, you know, on the part of those who are working to establish the refugee camps and work with the refugee population. And it's also important to note that in the Middle East, um, the refugee situation is very different um, then we often think about the traditional refugee camp because you have refugees in the camps, like in Zatari and Jordan, but you also have a large number of refugees that are in urban centers who may not be officially registered with UNHCR. Um, and, you know, one of the issues that often comes up in camps is when populations outside of the camps see um, the refugees gaining access to more water than those outside of the camp. Um, and this is, this is an area that, you know, we identify as critical um, to ensure the sustainable management of resources, but also that there are, um, um, there are viable and strong relationships developed between the host populations and the refugee populations, because you know, these are people who have fled war-torn societies and you don't want, you know, um, they are often very vulnerable and at risk. And so there's a need to be aware of increasing tension over new conflicts that can emerge um, over water resources that may not have been there before, but only when you have an influx of a new population. The, the I think this is a very interesting example because the, you have the kind of the, I don't want to call it the baseline, but um, without the Syrian refugees, there's the whole question about how does Lebanon manage its water resources, uh, including as it recovers from conflict. And even as it's struggling to do that, it has, it's trying to cope with the refugees on top of that and um, uh, providing water and other uh, services to them. And so I, I think it's, it's a very complicated situation. We were involved uh, looking at the um, Latani River Authority. The Latani River is uh, the, the, the primary river that's entirely contained within the country. Very important for agriculture um, and also for other uses. One of the challenges that uh, we found was th th the the fragmentation, the social fragmentation in Lebanon meant that um, uh, if somebody was underperforming or not performing within the authority and they tried to um, discipline that person or fire them, 
the next day there'd be somebody from that person's group, whichever ethnic group they were. Why do you hate the blanks? What do you have against us? So it, it, was, it never had to do with the particular person's performance. It was all based on identity and everything was seen through that, which made it a very difficult place to um, discipline non-performers or to motivate uh, high performers, which I, 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 you know, that has nothing to do with the Syrian refugees, but it's, I thought it was a very interesting dynamic of a conflict affected country trying to rebuild its institutional capacity, practice, morale, and motivation. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, that's a great example, Carl. Um, I don't have really anything else to add. Um, then maybe if we shift, uh, there's a series of comments and questions um, about Colombia and linking uh, extractives and um, uh, and water, and I'd, I'd like to kind of add to that a little of my own observations, but starting, just starting with what the student says. In Colombia, we have a big problem with mining companies in capturing and using water. In the post-conflict process, they, they say they want to promote peace building uh, with this false premise of progress, what to do. The mining concessions cover the entire Andean region where most of the important rivers flow and nourish the aqueducts for human consumption. And all these areas have mining concessions. And um, this, this question strikes me as not unique to Colombia. There, there's a similar process that has already unfolded in Sierra Leone, where uh, in the post-conflict push to develop to generate revenues, the government has granted concessions, to mining, mining um, exploration permits and extraction uh, agreements um, that cover more than 80% of the country. And there's both the consumption of the water and the pollution mm -hmm. of the water, that, uh, which, which can affect not only uh, domestic consumption, but also agriculture and the agricultural um, uh, concessions that the country is entering into. And this raises another one of those uh, coordination issues where the mining ministry might be entering into agreements, making commitments for water and water quality, and the agricultural uh, ministry is entering into similar uh, concessions with different people also promising certain amounts of water of certain qualities. And so uh, wondering if you have thoughts on um, what to do or how, or how to be thinking about this? Yeah, um, this, again, this is an incredibly important topic and really relevant for those of us that are working in the field of post-conflict peace building. Um, you know, it's both an academic question and a practitioner policy question. Um, what are the best mechaniz mechanisms um, or tools available for um, protecting water resources at the same time that the extractive industry is able to develop. And so you can parse this question in many ways. Um, you know, one of the ways to look at it is to look at the module on renewable and non-renewable resources, where we talk about um, not, you know, the importance of also developing the renewable sector at, and not just the non-renewable sector, the extractives, because um, for governments, the extractive sector is, um, it's a sector that can generate revenue much more quickly. Um, so, and um, there's a lot more interest in the sector again, from you know private corporations, government officials, and even community members who may see this as a way of generating much needed revenue to build infrastructure to build social services um, and you know with that it's also the rec recognition that um, policymakers and the private sector need to pay attention to the renewable sector and so you know this isn't getting directly at the question I'll get there um, I'll focus more on that in a second but just noting that one should not overlook the renewable sector uh, which is looking at water, looking at fisheries, looking at um, you know, even timber, 
um, as ways to generate income. So not to rely just on mining because the mining sector does um, generate a lot of negative externalities as the student is recognizing when it comes to gold mining in particular or oil and gas production. Um, so if the extractive sector, you know, if a country decides to move forward with developing the extractives, how do you then build safeguards? And that's been one of the areas that we've also um, have been discussing in the MOOC. Um, what types of safeguards can be put in place, um, um, you know, especially in the contracts when the private sector or a state-owned company signs a contract with a government or even a local community, can you put in safeguards for protecting water resources? Um, that they need to be treated, that they have to be of a certain quality, um, because often a lot of the environmental factors are not front and center to a contract. So building in these safeguards. Um, also thinking, you know, looking at what co corporate social responsibility practices have been put in place. Have they created a, um, you know, have they signed a community-based agreement with the community that would give the community certain assurances? Um, what type of communication has taken place with the community? And these are, you know, things that should be required of companies when they come in to areas where you have populations um, living. We have examples throughout the MOOC of, um, from Nigeria. And I think Nigeria is a very good example um, that everybody should look at to learn from. Because there you had decades of extraction that led to um, pollution um, from the oil and gas sector. and you know, what, how do you then go about, you don't want to get to the situation like Nigeria where you're having to do a cleanup um, because that raises a whole other set of issues related to, you know, who's responsible. Um, so building in all these issues up front um, through either a community-based agreement, CSR practices, um, you know, into the, looking at the contracts very specifically, I would say is probably one of the best mechanisms. And then there's also areas of research um, where people are focusing on these global public private partnerships um, to look at what standards are available for the private sector, you know, through the global compact and others, you know, are, are the companies that are working in the extractive sectors, do they adhere to global standards? Have they signed on to the global compact? Have they signed on to the extractive industries transparency initiative? Um, because those companies may be more um, attuned and aware and, um, you know, willing to abide by a set of, you know, better practices. Um, so there's there's a number of um, tools that can be leveraged to um, hold um, companies to standards to, you know, to protect water resources um, and to promote better transparency and accountability in their practices. And to add to some of those tools, uh, I'd like to suggest a couple of others that we've seen in places. Um, uh, one is uh, the, the trying to uh, recognizing that post-conflict periods, there's a lot of pressure on governments to be generating revenues and to be using their resources to do that. Um, some Sometimes post-conflict settings, they're not optimal investment uh, situations. The countries um, are often uh, not able to negotiate the best rates for their, uh, for their resources. And so often you, you see some countries, some countries try to slow down the process of giving out the concessions and maybe auctioning them off rather than just having a set fee um, to regain or to gain maximum uh, benefit from those concessions. Um, there's a process that uh, I think we talk about in uh, this module, uh, Map X. Um, it's a tool, a mapping tool, where it, it, this helps to integrate the different uh, sectors. You can have the the mining concessions and the forestry concessions and the agricultural concessions all on the same map. 
as well as other information that might relate to uh, protected areas or water quality or localized conflict. So integrating that into a, a single process. And the, the, the MapX uh, chapter is, is a good resource for that. Um, on the, uh, one of the things that has been done, I think it's also important to recognize that there's pollution that happens now from the mines as they're operating and then after and there's often a legacy of uh, extraction. And so one thing that countries often try to do is they introduce what are called remediation bonds. The company, in order to start operation, has to put up a certain amount of money to clean up afterward. Um, this is a good practice. The difficulty is that too often the bond is not enough to, to pay the full costs. And so depending on the type of operation, we've seen some places remediate as they go along. Um, saw this in Sierra Leone with uh, rutile. Uh, I think it was rutile or bauxite. I think it's rutile. Um, that they would uh, mine one area, then they mine the next area and they put the fill from there into the first area. And then they mine a third area, put that into the second area so that you can remediate as you go along. And if the, even if you run out of money for remediation, at least most of the remediation is already done before the place closes. This, this works where you're doing this um, surface mining, if you will. It's harder for the, for the deep uh, um, holes. And then I guess the, the last thing, coming back to some of the things you were saying, Erica, was uh, training communities on monitoring of water quality, mm -hmm. that that's often one of the biggest impacts. And they don't know, there isn't a lot of trust with the government, which has an incentive to keep the mine there. So ha providing some sort of independent means to actually say, what is the water quality and what is the water quantity um, flowing out of the uh, downstream from the mine? Yeah. No, I agree. This, these, there's a whole basket of um, tools and information, I think, that we've included in the MOOC throughout. Um, but a lot of these, you know, come back to um, making sure the community is involved in some of the contract design, that these mechanisms are put in place that would allow for remediation and monitoring um, throughout the process. Um we have uh, time for maybe two or three questions. I'm wondering if um, you might be able to talk um, about what it's like to enter the field uh, of environment and uh, environment, peace and security. Um, a lot of there are a lot of students enrolled in the MOOC. Um, what is different about studying or entering or working in this field than other environmental fields? And what sort of career advice do you commonly give your students who are interested in environment, conflict, and peace? Um, I mean, this is, you know, I'm in a school of the environment and I am definitely, um, you know, one of the few that, you know, works in conflict and fragile countries. Um, so, you know, in that way, it makes it very different than studying global processes related to um, global climate change, the Paris Agreement, um, you know, looking at U.S.-China relations. Um, you know, being someone who works um, in um, fragile states or conflict-affected zones, um, you know, you don't, it's, how do I, um, there, you need field experience, I guess would be the first piece of advice that I would give my students who've always want to, um, work in this area. Um, you know, you have to really understand the problems that are taking place, um, in countries that have experienced conflict, who have experienced even a, a, a disaster. Uh, to really understand the needs of the population, but also how it may be very different um, for the ecosystems that have been affected. Um, you know, just thinking about the marshlands in Iraq um, versus wetlands, um, you know, in the United States, largely because the environment has become a political tool. 
So it's understanding this relationship between um, environmental management and politics and security because they're so interwoven. Um, and you know, I think for all of us who work in this field, we take a very comprehensive and broad view of this topic. I mean, we look at it through the entire conflict cycle. We don't try to parse it and say, I'm only working on this one particular um, part of the conflict cycle because recognizing that um, the environment can be used in different ways at different um, and natural resources in different ways um, throughout the conflict cycle um, and can be affected too. Um, but also recognizing that this isn't a linear process. So even if you're working on um, you know water and development, you may have you know an outbreak of conflict again and that changes, how you develop your program. So you need to think more about how to be adaptive, how to build resilience into um, your programming and thinking about climate or um, conflict sensitivity um, tools in your programs. So I think, you know, I would tell my students, you have to be very adaptive in this field um, because there are, you know, as I said before, there isn't a one fit all solution. Um, and, you know, having the field experience, but also being able to communicate with different, um, you know, different communities. So you may be working um, with an NGO, um, you know, in a community-based project. At the same time, you need to be able to communicate with members in the UN system or that work for particular donor agencies um, so I think, you, you know, you, you need to be well versed in a lot of, um, you know, literatures too, both from the practitioner side and the academic side, because the practitioner side has developed lots of toolkits, um, that keep evolving. And so, um, you know, it's, that's what makes this field so exciting because it, there's, um, it, it is a vibrant field. It's also an important field that has policy relevance. And so you have to really care um, to be in this field and to be passionate. And as you know, you asked me earlier to stay up at night. <laughs> um, you mentioned field experience. Any recommendations or suggestions on how to get the necessary field experience? Um, I think this varies for people, different people at you know, their stage, what stage in their career they're at. You know, I'm in the university setting, so I deal with students. Um, so I'm always encouraging my undergraduates to go abroad. Start as early as you can. Pick um, a study abroad program um, that will, you know, put you outside your comfort zone at times, take you abroad so you're, you're, you're gaining exposure. Or going to work for, you know, an international NGO organization, um, volunteering, um, but networking, being part of a network is going to give you access. Um, and you may find, um, you know, starting early volunteer opportunities, short-term consultancies um, that may be able to leverage your tools, gaining experience with particular tools like mapping tools that could be useful or, um, you know, tools in the water sector for, um, you know, different technologies or water purification. Um, but, you know, taking some time and trying out different opportunities um, to gain that experience and build out, um, you know, the resume. Uh, you also uh, made an allusion there to uh, uh, the, the things that excite you. And I'm wondering, how does one maintain, how? How do you or how do you recommend people maintain their optimism or, you know, you work in all these difficult places. You see some of the horrible things that people do to one another. How do people not burn out? Um, you know, we have a tendency to focus on the failures and we forget there are successes. And so I think, you know, we have an obligation too as a field to collect the success stories um, of the programs that have, you know, had a positive outcome that have, you know, in the water sector, I guess I work in, you know, 
um, one of the sectors where you do see water as a tool for cooperation, uh, for bringing people together, um, because water is needed by everyone, and and you know it is recognized that you know at times you can own, you need to cooperate to have clean water or access to water. So I think. Um, you know, looking for those success stories, not always the failures. We like to have lessons learned both um, where things didn't work so we can find a better way to um, deliver water services, but also when, um, you know, people have come out of conflict, when they've learned to manage their resources in a sustainable way, um, when you see, you know, women, young girls being able to go to school, um, because they have access to clean water and sanitation, um, you know, in their schools. So I think there's, you know, or you see agricultural yields um, come back and improve after decades of conflict. So recognizing that there are successes and trying to remind yourself of, um, you know, the situations where you have seen um, positive results. Well said. And I, I, I would like to end there, but we have one last question that I'd like to ask. Uh, but I, I really like your answer because so much of it is you, you acquire knowledge and connections and how do you keep people in the field? How do you keep people working on this? I think that's a really important question and not just because it's important, but uh, keeping people optimistic and, uh, and, and forward looking. Um, the question is, from the student is asking if you might be able to speak on the perceived propensity of the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam being a cause of conflict with Egypt. Um, I will say a few words, um, and I'll let you also jump in. Um, you know, this goes back to where we began today. Um, with this relationship between water for agriculture and water for electricity. Um, Ethiopia and Sudan have had a water sharing agreement. I mean, not Ethiopia, Egypt and, um, excuse me, Egypt and Sudan have had a water sharing agreement for decades over the Nile, where about 80% of the water would go to Egypt, 20% to Sudan, and the rest of the riparians in the Nile Basin weren't party to the agreement. Um, and as you know, we discussed earlier, um, states' interests change over time, and Ethiopia has um, had an interest in harnessing the water from the Blue Nile for electricity, and has moved ahead in doing so. Um, it is not surprising then that this has. Um, um, aggravated tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt. It has been a source of tension because this will change how water is allocated in the Nile Basin. Um, Egypt is about 98%. I mean, it is almost entirely dependent upon water from outside of its borders. So this, you know, this will have a tremendous effect on Egypt no matter what. Um, because a lot of the population lives in the Delta, they depend upon water for agriculture. Um, you know, the challenge right now is, I think, for the states in the Nile Basin to come together and discuss how they can, as an entire basin, manage um, the waters of the Nile. There has been efforts um, coordinated through the World Bank with the Nile Basin Initiative, um, also through the African Council of Ministers, Water Ministers. I mean, there's been a lot of um, different actors focusing on water in the Nile Basin. Um, there, there, ha there isn't a solution at this time, um, but it is. This is a. This is something that is very political. Um, it has increased tension and needs to be acknowledged. And there is also a necessity and need for the states to rethink water sharing um, in the Nile Basin, because it's not just Ethiopia, it's South Sudan, um, it is Rwanda, it is all the states in the Nile Basin who have changing interests um, and needs when it comes to the waters of the Nile Basin. 
I don't know if you want to add something. Um, I, I think, as you say, it's, it's very interesting how the, the uses and the assertiveness of the different countries has evolved over time. And um, the, 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 as the countries shift from, say, subsistence agriculture, uh, so when, when the agreements that you're referring to, which, you know, in the 50s and earlier, um, there wasn't the sort of industrial agriculture, especially in the upstream riparians. And as uh, Ethiopia is modernizing and has more technology, as Kenya or Uganda are developing and they're looking at, you know, using water differently than they had, or as you said, which I think is a fascinating question that I haven't seen anyone really working on, what are the riparian rights of South Sudan? How much of Sudan's water does South Sudan get? Uh, 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 nobody <laughs> wants to talk about this. Um, you know, th those sorts of questions need to be addressed. And the um, for a long time, there was a reluctance on the part of some of the downstream countries to even have a discussion about this. And that seems to be changing. There's still a reluctance to talk about it, but also an acknowledgement that things are happening with or without them. Um, I think the interesting aspect of this is the, uh, the wording of the question, the perceived prop propensity of the dam being a cause of conflict. This has been something that people have talked about for quite a while. Um, every now and then there are some rather uh, strong words that are said. We haven't yet seen conflict. Doesn't mean that we won't, um, but it's a, it, it does raise this interesting question about how do we approach this not from a, from a water law perspective or a development perspective, but from a security perspective. And I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I think, thing, I think the, the dialogue is critically important to preventing conflict. I think there may be some other options in terms of technologies, uh, water efficiency, water reuse, desal. There might be uh, ways of uh, enlarging the size of the water pie, if you will. But it's a it's a very good question, and as you say, one that's uh, highly political. Yes, and so uh, so Erica, um, I think it's time for us to wind up. Is there any final words for uh, the students? Um, I just hope everybody's enjoying the MOOC um, and that you'll stay engaged with the community um, and you know, look for additional information coming on how we're gonna hope to um, continue to maintain this community of scholars and practitioners, um, students who are interested in environmental peace building. Um, so it's an ongoing discussion and it's great to have so many of you involved. Excellent, thank you all, bye.